Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Let's learn, guys. It's a great day. Epic History TV. Napoleon seizes power of the Brumaire coup. Preemptive, like, my name's Connor. If you're new, the original link. Top description, Discord, all the other links down there. Time to learn. If you're not ready to learn, back of the class. Let's go. We need Bonaparte. Newspaper Le Surveillant. August 1799. October 1799. After 500 days campaigning in Egypt and Syria, Napoleon has returned to France. And with a small entourage, he travels north to Paris. Everywhere he goes, he is greeted by crowds, embraced by dignitaries, and fated as a conquering hero. Stay hydrated, such guys. celebrations cannot hide that France is a country in crisis and despair. Banditry is so rife that Napoleon's own luggage is stolen en route. Prices really? are soaring. So too are taxes. Trade has been decimated by years of war and blockade. There is conscription, censorship, and corruption. Perfect environment Abroad, for a new ruler, France perhaps. once more faces a powerful coalition of enemies. And though General Massena's brilliant victory at Zurich has won respite, France is not safe yet. But in Bonaparte, many see a savior for the country. Thanks to his own propaganda, everyone has heard of his brilliant victories in Italy and Egypt. His name is celebrated in newspapers and plays. The air rings with cries of, hurrah for Bonaparte, he will save the country. Not everyone is thrilled by the general's return. At the very top of French government, some wonder if Bonaparte should not be court-martialed for abandoning his army in Egypt, and now flouting France's quarantine laws. However, Napoleon does now have a letter from the Directory ordering his return to France though he acted before receiving it. There's also concern that a move against such a hugely popular general could easily backfire. For his part, Napoleon regards the government with contempt, a sentiment he's happy to share in private. Over breakfast, he tells General Thibault these men are bringing France down to the level of their own blundering. They are degrading her. Well, what can generals expect from this government of lawyers? To Napoleon, it's self-evident that he would do a better job, given all his glorious achievements in Italy and Egypt. Since 1795, France has been ruled by the Directory, a five-man executive whose members hold power for five years. In 1799, its members are Paul Barras, Napoleon's first patron, infamously corrupt and dissolute, but a shrewd political operator. He has been a permanent member of the Directory since its formation. Emmanuel Thermidorian. Well, Joseph Sayes, a former priest who wrote the revolution's most famous political pamphlet, now regarded as the leading political thinker in France. Then, three staunch Republicans, appointed to the directory just four months ago, under outside pressure. Louis Goyer, a veteran Jacobin and former minister in the National Convention. Jean-Francois Moulin, 
a Jacobin general who had commanded in the bloody war in the Vendée, and Pierre Roger Ducot, a more moderate figure and ally of Sayes. The other major element of government, the legislature, is comprised of the Council of 500, who draft laws, and the Council of Elders, who approve them. Members of both councils dress in extravagant costumes, inspired by their great model, to which they refer constantly, the ancient Republic of Rome. This government, the Directory in particular, is now widely regarded as corrupt. Sometimes I wonder if lower houses in governments are just a cover for continued rule of, um, like, like if the lower house can only propose things that the upper house has to agree to, then I feel like creating a lower house that is, can be a sort of front for, can be like displaying your, your system as more democratic than it really is. I'm not saying, I mean, America has a, a lower house and, I'm just saying that if you wanted to portray yourself as more democratic than you are, then I would create a lower, uh, you know, a lower legislator, le legislature that at the end of the day is still only as powerful as the higher, you know, house is a, is it is willing to to pass the stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not super important right now. I just thought particular is now widely regarded as corrupt, ineffective and unfit to survive. And powerful men on the inside will play a leading role in its destruction. I returned to France at a fortunate moment when the existing government was so bad it could not continue. Stuff like this really makes me think of how many great rulers did not have the luck to be in a time that was so conducive to a coup, you know? And, and it shows you how, uh, as amazing as people like Napoleon are, as great figures, they're, they're really only able to achieve what they did a lot of the time because of the time period they were born in and the structure of government that they, they came into so much like instances and like the, uh, the moment where they were almost captured by the Engli by the British Navy on the way to Egypt. So many times where it, it could have, he could have easily just been an obscure general in the French army, but because of a lot of lucky stuff and because of his, you know, his greatness, it's greatness too powerful board. On his return to Paris, Napoleon takes up residence in the home of the Beauharnais family on Rue de la Victoire, which has been renamed in his own honor. It just makes me think what other great rulers would we know of had they been in a time more conducive to them taking over. Given the unsettled political climate, he faces an uncertain and potentially dangerous few months in the capital. One man he can count on as a valuable guide, his younger brother, Lucien. He serves in the Council of 500 as the deputy for Corsica and has recently been elected its president. As such, he will be a key player in the weeks ahead. But first comes a stormy reunion with his wife, Josephine, which quickly gives way to a passionate rapprochement. rapprochement? Both have been guilty of infidelities, but Napoleon is clearly still in love, and his earlier talk of divorce is quietly forgotten. Henceforth, Josephine will prove a faithful wife, and through her social connections, an important political ally. Paris is awash with talk of plots and conspiracies. 
rumors of threats from the left, ex-Jacobins, who oversaw the bloody days of the terror. And from the right, secret royalists who want- Jacobin, Jacobite, connected? Want to turn Are those? back the clock. Right, secret royalists who want to turn back the clock. And there are those who seek a third option. Soon after his arrival in Paris, Napoleon receives a visit from France's ex-foreign minister, Maurice de Talleyrand. Talleyrand, a keen observer of which way the political wind was blowing, had resigned from the government in July. Having worked with Napoleon in planning the Egyptian expedition, he now proposes they collaborate on another plan to replace the government of France. Napoleon, disgusted by the current regime, immediately welcomes the idea. Talleyrand then reveals that a member of the directory itself is working to bring down the regime. Say us. The country's leading political thinker has decided that the directory must be cast aside and that France must have a new constitution, which he intends to write. He plans to sweep away the chaotic, unruly legislature and its weak, ineffectual executive. To save the Republic, radical reforms are needed and an entirely new form of government. Sayes already has the support of another director, Roger Ducot, and the president of the Council of Elders, Louis-Nicolas Lemercier. He even has the support of the president of the Council of 500, Lucien Bonaparte. Minister of Police, Joseph Fouché, who has eyes and ears across Paris, is also aware of their conspiracy, but has agreed not to intervene. Now, Sayes seeks a sword, as he puts it, a military figurehead to keep the army on side and be wielded at the decisive moment. Who is that? And then sheathed afterwards. But such a man is proving difficult to find. Sayes's first choice had been General Joubert, Napoleon's talented subordinate at Rivoli. But he'd been killed earlier that year shot dead at the Battle of Norvi in northern Italy. General MacDonald is sounded out, but is too much the honest Republican for such skullduggery. General Moreau, who has led the Army of the Rhine with great success, declines the role. In a moment he will later regret, he recommends Bonaparte. There's your man. He will make a better job of your coup d'etat than I could. Say yes does not like Napoleon. His ambition is too obvious. It is Talleyrand who persuades Sayes that they have found their sword. On the 23rd of October, Napoleon Surely and Sayes meet for the first him. time. They agree that the Republic is in grave peril from enemies within and without, and that the Directory cannot meet the challenge. Within a week, they agree to launch a coup to overthrow the government of France. Hair is ripe. Conspirators plan their coup for the 7th of November, 16th Brumaire, according to France's revolutionary calendar, the month of fog. It's a risky operation that will take two days, during which any number of things could go wrong. Many of the plotters take precautions. Sayes carries a briefcase stuffed with cash for a quick getaway. 
Fouché, the Minister of Police, has drafted orders for Napoleon's arrest in case he needs to switch sides. I mean, this all makes sense. Napoleon sleeps with two loaded pistols by his bed. At the last minute, there's a 48-hour postponement. So instead, that night, Bonaparte dines at General Bernadotte's apartment on the Rue de Cisalpine. They are joined by Generals Moreau and Jourdain. This is got to be nerve-wracking, to say the least, because it's not like you can just go in there and and you know kill or capture the main people at the top. Who knows if the people below them are going to follow you, and as in order to avoid that, you have to go around talking to people, trying to get people on your side. The more people you talk to is the more people that can rat you out. Harry. He wants the support of these influential generals for his coup. Moreau agrees to help. Jourdan promises not to interfere. But Bernadotte is outraged and warns Napoleon that he'll be guillotined. We'll see, says Napoleon. Brumaire. So today's the day for clearing out the rubbish dump. Sorry, question. So today's the day for clearing out the rubbish dump? Conversation between soldiers overheard by police spy. The 9th of November, Paris. In the crisp hours before dawn, Napoleon meets around 60 officers that he's invited to his house. He informs them that he's decided he must act to save the Republic and asks for their support. They affirm their loyalty with oaths of allegiance. The most important man to convince is General Lefebvre, the no-nonsense military commander of Paris. But Napoleon knows his man. He presents Lefebvre with the sword he wore at the Battle of the Pyramids as a mark of his great esteem. And the general is won over. Let's go throw those bloody lawyers in the river, he growls. At 7 a.m., the Council of Elders meets in an unscheduled early session at the Tuileries Palace. Only Sayas's allies have been invited, so without opposition, they quickly passed two measures. First, Napoleon is to be given immediate command of the Paris military district, using the pretext of a non-existent Jacobin plot. Second, tomorrow the legislature will move from its usual meeting place in the center of Paris to the Chateau de Saint-Cloud, five miles west outside the city. This, the plotters tell the council, is for their own safety. The Paris mob is famed for its unpredictable and violent political interventions. The move is, of course, to protect the conspirators themselves from such an event. At 10 a.m., Napoleon arrives at the Tuileries. He speaks to the Council of Elders, reassures them that the trusted generals Lefebvre and Berthier are by his side, and concludes, we want a republic founded upon true liberty, on civil liberty, on national representation. We will have it. I swear it. Meanwhile, that morning at the Luxembourg Palace, where the five directors reside, Sayas and Roger Ducot announce their resignation and urge Barras, Goyer, and Moulin to follow suit. Barras decides to take a long bath and will not be disturbed. Perhaps he is mulling his options or waiting for an offer. When it comes, it is from Talleyrand, 
the man who perhaps understands him best. With the help of an enormous bribe and the reassurance that he will keep all his estates, Barras agrees to resign. France's longest serving director and once formidable power broker quietly leaves the stage. He is driven to his country house that evening under military escort. Goyer and Moulin are not so easily persuaded, and so they are placed under house arrest by General Moreau. Their objections are futile. With the resignation of three directors, the executive is constitutionally defunct. The conspirators have what they want, a power vacuum, to which they will propose a solution the next day at Chateau de saint Cloud. This is very well done. It will be a day on which the- Like, almost too good. This is going too well. Chateau de saint Cloud. It will be a day on which the future of France hinges. That evening, as Napoleon rides through the Place de la Concorde, where so many had died under the guillotine, he turns to his secretary. Tomorrow, he says, either we will sleep at the Luxembourg, or we'll end up here. Citizen representatives, the circumstances in which you find yourselves are not ordinary. You are on a volcano. Napoleon, the Council of Elders, 10th November, 1799. 19th Vermeer, day two of the coup. Napoleon rises at 4 a.m. and rides to saint Cloud. Yeah, I would not be sleeping easily. There he meets Murat, newly promoted to General of Division, whose 6,000 troops surround the chateau. Officially, they're there to guard the council members. But as deputies arrive for the day's session, the heavy military presence is impossible to miss. There are long delays. Benches have to be found for the chambers. Council members have time to mingle and discuss the many swirling rumors. This time, the Jacobin deputies are present and they're not happy at being excluded from the previous day's meeting. When the councils finally begin their sessions at 1 p.m., the mood is raucous. The sudden resignation of the directors, the presence of so many troops, the claims of a Jacobin plot, there is much to discuss. The plotters had hoped for a quick vote to establish a new provisional government. But the presidents of both councils struggle to take charge. Hours pass. Napoleon loses patience. At 4 p.m., he bursts into the Council of Elders. As he begins to speak, he is heckled and derided. Napoleon is thrown off balance. He rambles, mutters, then hesitates. When a deputy interrupts, what of the Constitution? Napoleon flings back, the Constitution? You yourselves annihilated it. There is uproar. Napoleon continues, demanding action from the Council. Anyone who speaks against him, he strongly implies, has been paid by the British. To any such deputy, he warns, may the lightning of war crush him instantaneously. Remember that I walk accompanied by the god of war and by the god of fortune. Internet? Sorry, guys, fixed it. I walk accompanied by the god of war and by the god of fortune. These ill-chosen words seem to confirm the assembly's very worst suspicions. 
By some accounts, Napoleon has to be dragged from the chamber by his staff, shouting, You are scoundrels! I will have you shot if you don't obey me! Napoleon is shaken, but not defeated. Within minutes, he storms down the corridor into the Council of 500, where the president, his brother, has lost all semblance of control. The mood here is of even greater defiance. The deputies have spent the morning swearing oaths of loyalty to the Constitution. And when Napoleon arrives, flanked by grenadiers, he receives a torrent of abuse. Down with the tyrant, they cry. Outlaw, Caesar, Cromwell. These, the names of famous generals, turn tyrant. As the crowd presses in, he is grabbed, jostled, even punched. Lefebvre and his grenadiers rush in to extricate Napoleon from the scaffold. They haul him clear and drag him into the courtyard outside. Since they've made you an outlaw, make them outlaws yourself. Napoleon is rattled and bloodied. He seems unsure what to do. His old comrade, General Augereau, now a council member, comes out to see him. You're in deep water now, Augereau tells him. Napoleon regains his composure. It was worse at Arcole. Nevertheless, the coup totters on the brink of disaster. If the council declares Napoleon an outlaw, it could mean a firing squad or a swift trip to the guillotine. But the riotous disorder has played into his hands. He is the military commander of Paris. When he hears Jacobin deputies are keeping his brother Lucien in the chamber against his will, grenadiers are sent to bring him out. Napoleon attempts to rally troops for a decisive intervention. News of his manhandling by the deputies outrages his old comrades. They are raring to go. But the Legislative Guard, the 400 troops charged with protecting the council, are not convinced. It is Lucien who seizes the moment. He mounts a horse and announces, citizen soldiers, the great majority of the council is at this moment being terrorized by a handful of deputies armed with daggers. These brigands are doubtless in English pay. I declare to you that these madmen have made themselves outlaws by their assaults upon the liberty of this council. Then he draws a sword and points it at Napoleon's chest. I swear that I will stab my own brother to the heart if he ever makes an assault on the liberty of Frenchmen. The doubters are won over. Oh. A signal is given. With bayonets fixed, troops flood. Whoa. I what? But a Frenchman. So he's saying I was confused at first. So he's saying like like if I like I, I promise you he won't is he saying like like I swear I would kill my brother if he if after this he he assaults like he 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 takes power or something like that. Not saying he would actually do that, but just to like give the soldiers guarding the, the council a reason to stand down. The doubters are won over. A signal is given. 
With bayonets fixed, troops flood into the Council of 500, with General Murat at their head. Citizens, you are dissolved, he shouts. And then to his men, get this damn rabble out of here. The deputies scatter. By some accounts, they jump out of windows, leaving their robes and hats strewn across the gardens. Certainly, the conspirators had hoped to avoid the use of troops, but it had always been a backup plan, one that turned out to be desperately needed. Later that evening, a few deputies are rounded up to form a rump council of 500. Joined by the similarly cowed Council of Elders, they approve the measures that are suggested to them. The dissolution of the Directory. The adjournment of both councils for four months, though they will never meet again. And the appointment of three provisional consuls, a term borrowed from the Roman Republic. I am. Emmanuel Joseph Sayas. Pierre Roger Duco. Napoleon? And General Napoleon Bonaparte. Three years, eight months since he took command of the Army of Italy. Napoleon <laughs> has risen to the summit of political power in France. He will now be one of three men in charge of drafting a new constitution for the Republic. But through his brilliance, energy, and immense popularity, he will soon overshadow his two colleagues. Only one man will emerge to rule France. It shows you how that, like, there isn't, like, these just tremendous great men who are just, like, put like become these great leaders just because like they're so individually it, it's a lot of force and luck and some strategy and being very charismatic and a great man all goes into it very interesting the first consul napoleon bonaparte the only consul and what better way to cement his hold on power than a new military campaign. And a return to Italy. Over the Alps time, again. Do you want to see our newest and most visually spectacular video? Right now, without ads. The Battle of Cape St. Vincent was a key naval clash of the French Revolutionary War. The battle that made Nelson famous, and we're telling its story with the help of 3D graphics and Unreal Engine. It's awesome. Water Nebula looks subscribers great. can watch it right now and know their subscription is helping to support our work. Nebula is a prestige streaming service built by creators to offer a more thoughtful. We're going to go through this, guys, but fantastic video as always from Epic History. I knew it wasn't flawless but it was a lot less flawless than I thought the takeover was. And that's the first time I've, I've gotten at all a more deep look in, in, into this, this event, the, the takeover. So very awesome video. To the oversaturated, chaotic environment we'll love to see any comments down below, like always, platforms. guys. No ads, no algorithm, no clickbait. Just hand-picked creators and quality content. It's quickly become the most interesting, fastest-growing independent video platform on the internet. And it's one which fairly compensates creators for their work. On Nebula, you can watch all our videos ad-free and often weeks before they're released on YouTube. There's content from hundreds of other great creators. And with Nebula's new category homepages, you can quickly find whatever you're after.
The History homepage shows just how much Nebula has to offer, including videos by our friends at Real Time History and the great Johnny Harris. Plus Nebula Originals, exclusive series that you can't watch anywhere else. One example, Real Engineering's Logistics of D-Day, a nine-part series looking in detail at the largest amphibious operation in history, from the planning to the landings to how they kept the machines running with an engineer's knack for clear technical explanations to the giant challenges faced by the Allies. All this and a massive discount for Epic History viewers. The link in our video description gets you... Please make sure to use the link, guys, slash Epic History. 40% off the annual plan. And it shows them that, you know, they're coming from Epic History, so... Awesome video, guys. Just want to make sure that I got the promo codes and links out there. Uh, love y'all. Hope you're all doing well. Great video. Would appreciate any comments down below, any answers to any questions I had, any comments at all. You're all really good with that, always. And uh, hopefully I'll see you guys next time. Bye.